Hi friends, I'm Jess. Welcome to the Hex Library, where I post reading, writing book, and planner related content a couple of times a week. Today we're going to talk about what books could summon me. So I first saw this video idea from Shay from Shay Geeks Out, who saw it from, I believe, HEA Booktubes. I will link all of the things down below for you to peruse if you so choose. Uh, basically, this is a group of books that if you were to create a summoning circle that would invite me to the circle, these are books that you could use to get me there. Seemed appropriate for Halloween, seemed appropriate for me. Had to do, you know? We're going to ignore the messy office also. We're also going to ignore that we're filming with the webcam because I turned on the camera. It was like you have three bars of battery. I did about two minutes of filming and then the battery sign started flashing and then it died and I was like that's not cool um, but it's Monday and this video is supposed to go up tomorrow so I guess I need to film it and edit edit and put it up and all those fun things. Um, so that's what we're going to do and we're just we're just gonna pretend like this is on the big pretty camera you can probably hear me better though because the microphone for this one is better it's a whole other thing for a whole other nickel anywho uh these are mostly in alphabetical order don't hold me to it um because i didn't pay too close of attention other than just author's last name and the first letter and then after that you know um because I can't pick a favorite. I mean, I, I actually can pick a favorite because I have a favorite. Um, but other than that one, I can't pick a favorite. I also picked 13 books because I was at nine and I was trying to choose a 10th and I was really struggling. And I was like, girl, why? You're summoning circle. 13, obviously. Um, so the first book is, of course, House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. So this book is three books in a book, essentially. Um, this is one of the weirdest things that I have ever read. No, nope, actually, probably the weirdest thing I've ever read. I don't even think one of is appropriate. I'm fairly certain I gave this a three out of five stars. Um, so it's not necessarily that I loved it, you know? So the first story in this is called the Navidson record and that is the haunted house story part of it where you're literally learning about a guy and his wife and I believe their two children who move into this house and the father is doing like some reworking and realizes that the inside of the house actually measures larger than the outside of the house now it measures like three quarters of an inch larger on the inside or on the outside than on the inside so like I never would have taken it this far, but it's fine. Uh, but they find out that there is like a door in their house that has a hallway that never ends. And they can essentially go in to this place. And it's like a maze. But is it? We don't know. And then the second story is by this old man whose last name is Zampano, or maybe his first name is Zampano. His name's Zampano. And so he is like the collector of all of the Navidson record. And he's put it into like this weird bind up of like a collection of, of pamphlets, leaflets, things. And then Zampano dies and it's picked up by Johnny. And then Johnny has it and he's reading through and he's added notes and footnotes and all of these things to it. And the idea behind the book is that it is essentially, this book is a published version of those notes. So it can be a little weird to know like what's factual and what's not when it comes to like things that you read on the book. It's kind of a farce like uh, The Princess Bride where you get The Princess Bride by William Goldman and it says that it was actually written by someone else and he took out like all of the long boring parts, but that's not actually true. Um, it's kind of like that. Um, the thing about this book is that it is wild. Like there are pages that are like, you know, and like the text is written in a way that 
it goes along with what the story is telling you. And there's things that are written backwards. There's things that are, um, you know, that have to be like figured out. There's like over a hundred pages of appendices. There are so many footnotes and a lot of the footnotes lead to like real things. Like there'll be a footnote about like a magazine article. And if you actually look up that magazine article, it'll be like an inside joke of what is in the book itself. Like you can get lost in the forums on this forever. And I love that about it. Also, the author's sister wrote a um, wrote an album that's like vaguely plays off of this. So a lot of people will listen to the album while they read the book. And so like the reason why I didn't love this is because um, Johnny, who is the main character of Johnny's story, um, he is an absolute piece of shit trash. And like... <laughs> He's really, like, he is, like, a drug addict. He talks about hookers all the time. Um, they are sex workers, but in this book, they're hookers. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things. And so, like, that part of it, I was, like, one star on Johnny's story, for sure. The Navidson record, 20 stars. The execution of this book, 5 million out of 5 stars. Like, the brain power that went into this, the things that you can, like, you could literally dive into this book and do theorizing about it for the rest of your life and never get into everything that is in here. It is one of those books where if you like to just, like, really sit and think about everything that's in it and, like, all of the little bits and pieces and trying to figure out, like, how much of it is real, how much of it is not real, how much of Johnny's story is actually the Navidson record and how much of the Navidson record is actually real. And it is a time. And by real, I mean real in this world, not in the one that we live in. Um, but, yeah, obviously, this book, you could summon me with it because I want to talk to you about it for literally forever. Other books I will talk to you about literally forever. Truth Witch by Susan Dennard. Um, you can't see it right now because it is behind the Halloween banner, but literally everything from this book all the way over to that skull right there is Susan Dennard books. I think she only has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine published books. I just own lots of copies of those nine books. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of copies of those nine books. I have six copies of this book in particular. I have the old U.S. version, the new U.S. version, the U.K. edition in hardback, the U.K. edition in paperback, the Serbian version, the German version, and the Taiwanese version. So I have seven. I have problems. Uh, the Truth Witch series is about Safi and Azult and Edwin and Merrick. I forgot Merrick's name for a minute. That's not good on me. Um, but yeah, it is set in a world where there are these different systems of magic and a truth witch, which is what Safi is, because title, um, they are really sought after for either being used for political gain or to be killed so that other people can't use them for political gain against you. And so basically they, her family has spent their entire life trying to hide her. And then she finds out that she's actually being betrothed to the king of her land. And she goes on the run with her friend Azult um, and tries to escape. And it becomes this huge, masterful, just multiple worlds you do traveling there's sea battles there's pirate ships there are multiple governments multiple religions multiple societies and you know i love society issues in books so when you give me multiple societies that have all the problems and they all have different problems and like some countries are war-torn and starved and some are just overrun with political people and they have so much money and surplus and then you have people that are all about power and you have some that have slavery and some that don't and just all of the things. I love this series. It's so good. It's so fucking good. I I can talk about this for literally forever. For literally forever. Not to mention the romances. I mean, the history of the world. Basically, this third book, which is technically like a 0.5, but is published in order of the third book it's fine. Uh, Sight Witch, the entire thing is just like the background and the history of the world. And the first six chapters of the fourth book, when you find out 
what's going on based off of what you read in the third book and your mind explodes. Like there's so many things in here. And the first time I read this book, I was like, this is a little predictable. Like, I feel like I'm able to read this and I kind of know what's going to happen. And then as every book has come out since then, and I do like a full reread every time a book comes out and I'm like, I never even knew that this thing that had, like, I was so busy paying attention to the things that I was able to guess that there's like 9 million things that I could never guess that are just there. And I'm like, I don't, uh, I can't. Okay. So I love this series. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. It is not complete. There's one more book coming out. The last book that came out, which was Witch Shadow, was a little weird in comparison to the other books, um, but that was based off of a decision by the publisher. Um, it has like two timelines in it, which is kind of weird, but I'm still here for it. Like I'm, I could literally talk to you about these books forever and not care because they're so good. Uh, next we have the Hex Hall series by Rachel Hawkins. This is one of my unabashed favorites. Um, it's YA. It's witchy. It's about a girl who's been thrown out of basically every school she's ever been to. So she gets sent to Hex Hall, which is like a place where they send magical students to help them learn how to operate their magic. And there are witch hunters in this world. And she's basically, they're afraid that she's going to let the witch hunters know where she is. And so they send her off to the school to like keep her under check. My biggest complaint about this series, it's a weird complaint. You're going you're gonna to love it. So do you see this cover? Do you see this right here? This thing we call a cat. A cat. There's no cat in this series. There is a cat on every cover and there is no cat in this entire series. I don't know whose idea it was to make this cover and put a cat on the cover and then not have a single cat in the series. In fact, the main character is allergic to cats. And I don't know whose decision that was. It wasn't my decision. I have questions. Rachel, help a girl out. Um, but I love the series. Like the romance is so good and like the world building is fantastic. And just the the last book. Oh my God, there's this part in the last book. <sighs> there's this part in the last book. Brianna, if you're out there, if you're still watching YouTube, you know. I don't think Brianna watches YouTube anymore, but if you're out there, my girl, you know. Um, there's this part, there's this whole thing that happens in the last book that just it destroyed me in so many ways. And then when you realize that, like, yeah, it, it, <laughs> yeah, this will summon me for sure. Uh, the next one is one that will make you cry for the rest of your life. And that is Medusa by Rosie Hewlett. Uh, it's very short, but Boy, she packs a punch. Uh, so this book is an interesting tale on Medusa, who, if you don't know, Medusa is a part of Greek mythology. She's a woman who was turned into a Gorgon by Athena for reasons. Um, and really the, like the, the lines on the top of this really explain Everyone in history has seen Medusa as a Gorgon, a killer, a monster. But when you think about her story, she is a victim, a survivor, and a protector. So Medusa's whole deal was she was a virgin priestess for a temple of Athena. And she was so beautiful that Poseidon seen her and he was like, I'm going to hit that. And so Poseidon decided that he didn't care what she wanted. And so he did the thing that the men do when they don't get what they want. And rather than Athena punishing Poseidon for touching her possessions, she decided that she was going to punish Medusa for being too seductive, essentially. Um, you know, she broke her maiden vow. So obviously she has to be punished. So she turned her into a Gorgon. You know, decisions. Decisions were made. That is like the story we've all been told about Medusa, you know, and Medusa, because she was a Gorgon, if people stared her in the eye, they turned to stone. It was a whole thing. Well, in this book, that does happen. And Medusa spends a good amount of time after being turned into a Gorgon, um, really 
trying to be the person she was before, but also come to grips with who she is and who she has been turned into. And there is some really funny parts where Medusa is actually in Tartarus. Like, and it's now it's 2020. It was 2019. I don't know whenever this was published, um, but it's like, you know, our modern day she's in Tartarus and she's telling us like her story of what happened. Medusa was eventually killed by Perseus. That is part of the myth. And this really walks you through what actually in this author's opinion could have happened between Medusa and Perseus. And it is one of the most beautiful and heartbreaking things that I've ever read. And this story really hit me because I have always like had this feeling that like Medusa is the original feminist. Like she's the original feminist story. And so I've always had like a personal attachment to Medusa, which is a weird thing to say, but I have. And her story really just resonates with me. This is one of the most beautiful and heartbreaking things that I have ever read. And I absolutely loved having read it. I've thought about rereading it, but I don't know if I can emotionally handle rereading it. So, but she's gorgeous and uh, I love her. Next, we have the Hunter Trilogy by Mercedes Lackey. This series follows our main character. What is her name? This series follows Joyo Charmand, who is a hunter, which essentially means in this dystopian world, there are monsters and the monsters try to eat the people and the hunters are able to pull um, hounds. Most of them are like dog or cat like, but there are some other weird ones, um, but they're able to pull hounds from the other world where the where the monsters come from and use them to fight off the monsters and the hounds basically eat the mana of the monsters and that's how they're able to destroy them um so this is a lot of like different creatures from mythology it does have gorgons it has um i don't d dragons all kinds of weird different mythical monsters and so they all exist in here and joy is taken from this remote village and moved into a larger city where her uncle is one of the pol political leaders of the city and she is put into this like tv show where they follow the hunters around and use them to like get points and it's like this big promotional thing and so she's like in this whole new world she's like a country bumpkin thrown into the middle of the city um she makes friends with the white knight who is like the best character and the series basically follows her it has a little bit of a romance but not much um she does have a romantic arc but it's not great it's mostly about the world building and joy's character growth and really a lot about morals and things i love this series it also broke me in a very similar way to hex hall actually um but worse so I mean, yeah, it's a fantastic series. I love it. I cannot recommend it highly enough. I picked up Rules for Vanishing by Kate Alice Marshall, but honestly, anything by Kate Alice Marshall, it's the whole author. It's not just this book. Her books are fucking creepy. They're just fucking creepy, my dude. Um, this book is about a vanishing town or a vanishing town, a vanishing road that is available at a certain time every year on the same day. And if you know the rules for how to get there, you can follow the rules and get in and vanish. But the road only opens on that time, on that day, once a year. And supposedly, if you follow the rules, you can make it all the way out the other side. There are tales of people who have done this. Well, our main character, her sister, tried it the year before and never came back. So she's decided that her and a group of her and her sister's friends are going to go in and they're going to get her sister and they're going to come back. And this book is fucking creepy. Okay? It doesn't matter if we're talking about her mid grade, which is 13s. It doesn't matter if we're talking about her YA, Rules for Vanishing, uh, These Fleeting Shadows. What else have I read by her? I don't even know right now. They're all fucking creepy. Her adult books, What Lies in the Woods, fucking creepy. Her books are all creepy. If you like audiobooks, Rules for Vanishing is great. These Fleeting Shadows, <laughs> an audiobook, oh, girl. Mm -mm. There are voices. There are voices. Like, she hears things, and they talk to you, 
they, they talk to her because you're listening to it. They're talking to you. And they're like, if they talk about a voice being like crinkly or gravelly or squeaky and they, and they make the voice sound like, and, 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 hoo, hoo. yeah, highly recommend all any and all <laughs> audiobooks for K. Alice Marshall books, any K. Alice Marshall, any audio I could talk about these forever. The way the books are connected, the way they're not connected. I didn't catch the connection. And then Julie told me about it. And I was like, girl, you must be kidding me. And then she was like, no, do you remember this part and this part? And I was like, oh, I do. You know what? Now that she mentioned it, and now I need to read them all again. Okay. Another oldie, but goodie and cheesy is a Vampire Academy of Eventual Mead. Um, I don't even know that I said that correctly, but the entire Vampire Academy series. Um, yeah, these are so bad but so good it doesn't matter if we're talking about the movie or the tv show or this book in fact we're actually doing these for off the tube chat next month we're reading the first book watching the movie and the tv series and having a conversation about them if you want to join me and kate for that um but both the vampire academy series and also the sequel series the um, bloodline series why are they so good why are they so good? Follows our main character, Rose, and her best friend, Lissa, who were in a major car crash and all of Lissa's family died. Lissa is a Maroi and a princess, which means that she is technically the head of her family because she's the only one left. And a Maroi basically just means she's a vampire. And Rose is a Dampier, which is like a half vampire, half human. And they are made to protect the Maroi. And... There's like lots of shady shit happening. It's all about the society issues, all about all of the crazy things going on in the background. And it is like a complete political clusterfuck. And they're in high school and they had to go on the run and they were like pretending to be college students and then they got caught and then they had to come back. And there's a romance, there's an age gap romance, which is weird because it's a YA. And I don't really know as an adult that I like condone that, but as a teenager, this was the shit. And you know, honestly, I'm not even mad about it anymore. Like, as an adult, I can read it and go, that's not appropriate. And I don't even care. Because you know what? I wasn't 16 dating a 24-year-old. So, obviously, I'm okay. That's a lot of math for somebody who's not interested. That was a line from the movie, by the way. Um, also, do I know how the movie starts? For sure, I do. Why can't you just be like a normal teenage girl and dream about hot naked guys on unicorns? Does it have to be unicorns? Of course not. It could be jet skis or mechanical pools or why is there a scary poster of an American ex-president? You said I needed to blend more into oregano society. We're in Oregon. You know you're completely hopeless as a human being, right? Just saying. I've seen the movie one or two times. Uh, next, we have my favorite book of last year, and that was all Our Hidden Gifts by Carolina Donahue. Oh my God, this book series. I have since finished the entire trilogy. It is so good. It is set in Ireland. It involves our friend uh, Maeve, who goes into detention, finds a set of tarot cards, and then is able to have a very weirdly accurate tarot card readings for all of the girls in school. And she has an ex-best friend, Lily, who really kind of hates her now because she was mean to Lily and she deserves for Lily to hate her. And she reads... Lily's cards and this weird card that no one has ever seen before comes up called the housekeeper card and the next day Lily goes missing and so Maeve and her new best friend Fiona and Lily's brother Ro get together and they have to find Lily and find out what happened to her and so it's like them and like the magic and learning about their magic and it deals a lot with LGBTQ issues as well as Catholicism in a way or Christianity I don't know which we're going to talk about but there's this group that's like an, a major hate group that are not in my opinion actually religious i think they're just hiding behind religion in order to be against these people but they're really looking for people like Maeve who have power and it is a wild fucking ride like all three books so crazy and then the end of the trilogy it is one of the most beautiful signals of friendship i think i've ever seen in my life it is one of the most just absolute gorgeous representations of friendship between these four characters and i wept as i am known to do and i really had a fantastic time with this entire series as i said this was my favorite book of last year and i 
cannot stop talking about it. Like everybody, I'm like, have you read it yet? Because you need to. Um, I love, 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 love this book. And also if you like to listen to audiobooks and you like accents, it's in Ireland. So our audiobook narrator has an Irish accent, obviously. That makes it even better. That was my favorite book of last year, but it actually wasn't the highest rated book of last year. But this book was Witchlings by Clarabel A. Ortega. This was the only book last year that got a 5.25 out of 5 stars, which means it was the perfect book. Now, perfect doesn't mean favorite. But it was real close. These were the two that were at the top of my bracket last year, and I had really struggled picking a favorite. And I think that one got favorite just because it was the more recently read one. Um, but yes, Witchlings, so good. This was written as a fully inclusive type of story for people who grew up with or who really liked the seven book wizard series that shall not be named. And I think Clarabelle did a fantastic job at not only that, but also making the story her own and also making the story fantastic. So our main character's name is Seven. And she is at an age where in her society, the witches that are of that age get together and they are sorted into covens. And each coven has a set number of witches that are it is allowed to have. And anyone who is left over after that is considered a spare. And the spares are very considered to not be powerful enough to do things. They are often treated more like indentured servants than regular people. So when she goes to the Black Moon Ceremony, which is what will decide which coven she's going to be in, she is put into the Coven of Spares. And she's put in there with her arch nemesis and a girl she's never met before. And in the society, you have to like create this magic circle in order for your coven to solidify. And if your coven doesn't solidify, then you all lose your magic forever. And Seven is like, well... Are, you know, being a spare is better than not being magical at all. But because it's her arch nemesis and a girl she's never met, her circle starts to not solidify. And so, and so Seven invokes the impossible task, which is an impossible task. And essentially, she has set the task of her and her coven mates to defeat the night beast. And the night beast is a beast that has been going around and has been harming other people in multiple cities. If they fail this impossible task, her and her two coven mates will be turned into toads forever. So we're following Seven, her two coven mates, them trying to overcome all of these things that have been thrown at them, and also trying to deal with the fact that, you know, they didn't get into the covens they wanted to get into, and they all have these personal life issues, and there is a lot of just like trying to figure out how to work with people who really aren't the people that you thought they were and learning that sometimes the person who's mean to you has bigger problems than what you ever could have imagined. And also learning that sometimes if you're able to help that person, you can make their life better, but also sometimes it doesn't necessarily do that and how to work with your friends and your family to overcome all of the evils. I've read the second book in the series. It's also very good. I'm very impatiently awaiting the third book in the series. Um, these books were fantastic. Absolutely love them. We could talk about it forever, but we're not going to. Okay. If you're wondering, I've been here for 35 minutes and I still have four books to go. Okay. Uh, next we're going to have Blood Like Magic by my friend Lizelle Sanberry. Um, this is a duology, Blood Like Magic, Blood Like Fate. This series follows Voya, who is a witch. And in her world, in her society, it's a near future Toronto no one asked you phone. It's in near future Toronto and it has a lot of sci-fi elements as well as the magic elements of it, which I think makes it even more fun than just like a regular like witch story. It's the sci-fi elements that really make it like its own kind of story, you know? And this book starts off with Voya having uh, basically the ceremony where she's going to be given a task by her ancestors in order to claim her full magic. And she's given the task and she fails. And so she's not going to get her magic. And she's like, bitch, no. And so she's like, give me another task. And which is something that, that doesn't typically happen. And they're like, fine, you must destroy the life of your first love. And she's like, girl, I'm, I'm not in love. I, I have nothing. So she decides that she's going to go on this dating app thing to help her find her first love. And then she's going to kill him. 
And when I tell you <laughs> that it goes in so many directions from there, it really does. It really does. And one thing about this book that is like my favorite is the community aspect of it and the the family aspect and the food aspect. There really is like so much food talk in here that will make you so incredibly hungry. And in this society of witches, they all have like different forms of um, what their family is good at. And blood is very strongly tied to everyone's magic. And just the community and like how they all work together and everything is so dang good. And I mean, I just, there's so much, so much about this whole ass entire duology that makes me so fucking happy. Like we could talk about it forever, but we don't have time to talk about it forever. But if you want to talk about it, you know where to find me. Uh, this next one is one that I really want to read again. But it's one of my favorites of the year. And that is Elantris by Brandon Sanderson. I just started reading Sanderson books last -ish year. And um, yeah, <laughs> I've been having the best time. I haven't read one for a couple of months because I've been doing a lot of other things. My goal was to read one a month this year, which I haven't done, but I have read a lot. Um, yeah read Elantris earlier this year, had the absolute best time. I loved this book. I love like the political aspects of it. As you know, your girl loves the political issues. I mean, if you look at this stack of books, how many of these have society and political issues? The answer is all of them, except for maybe Rules for Vanishing. That might be it, actually. That is legitimately the only one that doesn't have society or political issues. Okay, I have a type. Uh, yeah, this has a lot of political issues, society issues. It follows two main characters, three main characters. One of them is the villain, arguably. And then one's a princess, one's a prince. They live in this world where the Elantrians were these like nearly godlike magical creatures. And then at some point they all started to like get this weird disease and die. And then people in like the regular world sometimes will get the disease and then they just throw them over to the wall into Elantris and like they'll die. It'll be fine. And then the princess comes to the town to live with the prince, but she finds out the prince has been thrown into Elantris. It's a whole thing. She has to save him and save the world. And, you know, it's just, it's just a thing. And, like, it's, it's just, why is it so good? You know? Like, it's a 600-page brick of good. But this book follows, like, them getting, like, you know, figuring out, like, the magic part and, like, the world and the society and trying to, like, lead both sides of this revolution from opposite sides and not knowing that they're doing it because they don't know that the other exists, really. And it's, it's complicated, okay? It's a whole complicated, nuanced thing. But I love it. And it's fantastic. The next book, which is not the last book, it's book 12. There's another book after this one. But this next book is my favorite book. Like, of all time, period. Listen, I don't have reasons, okay? I mean, I have reasons. But I don't know how valid they are for you. They're valid for me. I don't know how valid they are for you. That is a semi-definitive list of Worst Nightmares by Crystal Sutherland. First off, can we talk about this fucking cover? I mean, she's so fucking gorgeous. Like, I can't. I can not. I cannot. I mean, honestly, anything by Crystal Sutherland will, like, pop me into the chat. But this is my favorite book of all time. Like, when I tell you, when I tell you it's my favorite book, and it's my favorite book, I have read this no less than seven times. And I think the first time I read this was in 2019. So it's not even like it's been out that long. Okay. The first time I read this, I read it in January. I read it via audiobook. And immediately the second I finished the audiobook, I picked up the physical copy and read the physical copy. I read it twice in one month, back to back the first time I read it. It was so fucking good. I like took the audiobook in and I was like, girl, I got to read this again. And then so I picked up the physical book and I read it again. And I have read it five more times since then. I read it every year around January, February time. Um, this was just the absolute 
bestest thing ever. Follows two twins, Esther and Eugene. Mostly Esther, but Eugene is there too. Eugene plays a large part in the story. Follows twins, Esther and Eugene. They come from a family that is cursed, they believe, by death. To die by their greatest fear. Their father is agoraphobic. He went to their basement and then was never able to leave the basement. Their mother is afraid of bad luck. She spends a lot of time gambling. And their grandfather is afraid of water. Their grandfather's dog was afraid of cats and got hit by a car while chasing a cat and died. They had a cousin that was afraid of bees and he got chased off of a mountain by bees and died. They had an uncle that was afraid of something. I don't remember what their uncle was afraid of and then he died. And then Eugene is afraid of the dark, more accurately afraid of the things that are in the dark that you can't see because it's dark, which I feel you on that one, Eugene, because me too. And Esther doesn't know what her greatest fear is yet, but what she does have is a semi-definitive list of worst nightmares, where she keeps track of all of the things that could possibly be her greatest fear, and then she just avoids all of those things, obviously, because if you avoid all of the things that you could be afraid of, you can't have a greatest fear, and then it can't kill you. This book starts off with Esther outside of the um, old people's retirement home where her grandfather is, and she bumps into Jonah Smallwood, who was her crush in grade school. He doesn't know that he knows who she is, but she is having a time. A and really, when they meet, um, Jonah is able to like weasel her out of like a week's worth of, of money that she's made, and her fruit roll up and her grandmother's bracelet and he is a pickpocket in case you didn't notice and it ends the first chapter ends with so you see the story of how esther solar was robbed by jonah smallwood is quite straightforward the story of how she came to love jonah smallwood is a little more complicated and when i tell you that this is written so well so beautifully so like, so Esther has anxiety. I have anxiety and depression. Esther has anxiety and depression. And her moments of anxiety are described to a T to the way that I feel anxiety in my physical body. Not just the mental part of it, but the physical part of it. It is described so well. And when you're reading it and you're going through these moments where Esther is having those anxious moments and it makes you feel the anxious moment because it is described so well. And so once Esther goes to Jonah and is like, give me all my stuff back, he finds her list. He stole her list as well. Um, <laughs> they decide that they are going to do all the things that are on her list that she's afraid of in order to kind of uh make death realize that she's there and looking for her because she wants to talk to death to get him to remove the family curse now one thing i always like to say when i talk about this book when you start reading this it will seem like they are really going for um like using the mental health angle as a curse and saying that like mental health issues will not be solved by treatment like medical treatment it does kind of have that angle at the beginning i promise you it does not have that angle at the end because if it did i wouldn't love this book the way that i do the way that i mean esther i think is 15 maybe 16 she's 16 because she can drive the way that esther's point of view of the curse progresses throughout the book is so beautifully done so well crafted there are moments of this book that will absolutely break you there i mean again i've read this book seven times and there are parts of this book that make me break down in tears to this day there are so many things about this book that really deal with fear um whether it's a fear of an actual thing or a fear of being seen um, a fear of not being seen. So many moments that are just like these really quiet moments that are so scary, but then also moments where they go to face a fear and they have like the absolute best time. And you're just like in the moment of, you know, 
one of the greatest feelings is facing your fear and realizing that it's not going to be the thing that kills you. And even though you're scared, doing it anyway. This book does have a lot of heavy topics. It does have um, death of a parent, child abuse, alcoholism, um, attempted suicide. There's a lot of things in here. Um, suicidal ideation. It's a lot. Like there's a lot. It's a very heavy book. But it is. I can't get enough. Like I can't get enough people to pick this book up. I finally, finally got an email from um, Penguin for the uh, the invocation, which is Krista Sutherland's newest book for the the arc. Because I'm over here like, listen, I realize I am not a big booktuber. I get it. Like, I am a small bean. I'm a small bean in the crowd. But when I tell you that I single-handedly on this platform have been advocating for this book since 2019, like, there's probably a quarter of the content that I have talked about on this channel has been this book. Like, And if this one doesn't sound like the one for you, that's okay, because that bitch has more books. She's got Our Chemical Hearts, which will fucking break your soul. I don't even know that it has happy moments, if I'm being honest. I don't know. I don't know if there's anything even happy in that book. That book might just be sad all the fucking way through. There's also a movie of that. It's fantastic. God, that book. That book is rough. That ooh, You find out the plot twist in that bitch. Whew. she will take you for a fucking loop, my dude. And then House of Hollow, which is like her YA spooky book. Mm -mm. That plot twist. Whoo, girl. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope, no way. It is in line with Kate Alice Marshall in Spooky World. I'm so excited for the invocations. You have no idea. I'm, I'm, I just got it this week. I'm not allowing myself to read it yet because I have other arcs that are due. But girl. <laughs> I'm so excited. So if you have not read this book yet, please do if you can handle the subject material. Um, why have my friends not all picked this up? I don't fucking know because it's the best book ever of all time. I read your favorite books. You should read some of mine. Also, if you're my friend and you have read this book and I haven't read your favorite book, what is your favorite book? Let me know and I'll read it in December because November is a readathon month and I have to read whatever Rainy Blue Reads tells me I have to read. So but I'll do it. If you'll read this, I'll read your favorite book. That's, that's my pledge to you. You read my favorite book and I'll read your favorite book. Leave it in the comments. And the last book that also made me fucking cry, which means all these books are pretty much books that made me cry. Well, let me see. Has Truth, which made me cry. Probs. Probably. Hex Hall. Fucking yeah. Medusa. Fuck yeah. Hunter Trilogy. Oh yeah. She got me. Rules for Vanishing? Out of fear? Yes. She has made me cry out of fear. Vampire Academy? Can I cry in Vampire Academy? I don't think there's any crying in baseball. Probably not. All our hidden gifts? Yep, I cried. Cried like a baby. Witchlings? Yeah, I cried. Bold like magic? Sobbed. Wept. I cried on like page 100. I actually have uh, reading reading vlogs for Blood Like Magic and Blood Like Fate. Oh yeah, I do. And I cried in both of them. Uh, Elantris, did Elantris make me cry? I don't remember. It's possible. So made a list of worst nightmares? I still cry every time I read it. it. Made me cry seven times. What a bitch. Uh, anyway, this last book also made me cry and it is The Bookish Life of Nina Hill by Abby Waxman. This is the only romance on the list. And I would say that this is more women's fiction with the romance in it okay um this book is about nina hill who is very bookish i don't know if you got that from the title and it is about how she has always lived her life basically her mom was like a photojournalist or something and so her mom's like always been all over the world and she has just stayed at home with her nanny for the majority of her life but now she's in her mid-20s her nanny has went home to live with her children and her grandchildren and so it's just nina and she works at a bookstore and she is happy with her life she has like 
a set schedule of what she does every day. She has a trivia club that she's part of. She's got life set. And then one day, choo, 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 this guy shows up and he's like, hey, your father died and you have to come to the reading of his will. And she was like, I don't even know who the hell my dad is. And she was like, and, 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 and the attorney guy's like, yeah, but your dad knows who you are. Well, he did because now he's dead. Um, but you need to come and meet your family. And she's like, my family. And he's like, oh yeah, your dad had like 57,000 kids. It's not really that bad. I think he had like six kids, but it's, that's outside the point. And so she finds out that she has this entire family. Most of her family, she is kind of introduced to through an uncle of hers who is semi in her age bracket. Um, he's a lot closer to her age than her older siblings are. Um, and I believe he's gay. I think so. And not, I think so as in like, he reads that way, but I think that he actually is, you know what I'm saying? I'm not being like, I think maybe he's a closeted gay. I mean, if I remember correctly, he's gay. Um, but yeah, she's introduced to most of her family through him and like, because they are the most similar in age and the most similar in like personality. And she's like, I don't really want to meet my family, but okay. And there's like drama about her being added in because her father had like all these multiple wives and multiple families. In fact, she has a sister who is like in her early teen years. Her dad was a strange person. And so while this book is about Nina and her having a romance and her learning about her life, a lot of this book for me was about her father and how I'm going to cry talking about it. Her father was a lot of different things to a lot of different people. He changed a lot over his life. He was not, he was never there for her, but that was per her mother's request. He was barely there for his oldest children because he was not a good father. He was an okay father to the children in the middle, but his youngest daughter, when he's in his old age, he was there for her for everything. It makes you think about yourself. And about how if someone talked to people who knew you when you were 15 and then talked to people who knew you when you were 30 and then 45 and then 60 and then 75, like what would be what those people have to say about you? Like what would those people have to say about you? What would, what would be the kind of person they would see you as and how different would you be and about how much we can change over time and sometimes that's for good sometimes it's for bad and i think a large part of why this book really fucking hits jessica so hard um is because of whoo, we're going into emotional turmoil um my relationship with my dad which is currently non-existent but when i was a kid was much like what Nina's younger sister is, is with her dad in that my dad was there for literally everything. Like I have been in the grocery store. I know I've told you guys this story before. I have been in the grocery store and seen a father and his daughter shopping at the grocery store and just like him being so kind to his daughter has made me cry. I have problems. Okay. And this book <laughs> highlights all of my problems um, because I am a bookish child who likes to be by myself. I come from a family with multiple half siblings. Um, I have siblings that are older. I have siblings that are younger. I do not have any siblings that are younger. That is a lie. I am the baby. I have siblings that are a little older. I have siblings that are a lot older. I have, you know, all of these things. Okay. I have uncles that are my age. I have all of the things. And so this book was really just like, I want to work, work at a bookstore. Can I have Nina's life? I guess I need to go play trivia and then maybe I'll meet a boy. Maybe that's where you meet boys at. Trivia night. Hmm. That's an option. Anyway. Um, yeah, this book. This book. And she has a cat. Nina has a cat. I have a cat. His name's Merlin. Nina's cat's name is Phil. And I think he speaks with a weird accent, if I remember correctly. Like in her head. He doesn't actually talk. That would be weird because it's not a magic story. Um. Anyway. Yeah. 
this book. Fantastic. This is this is the stack of books. Okay. This this be the books. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thirteen books that you can use to summon me. I've literally been recording for an hour. It's fine. Um, yeah. These are the 13 books that you could use to summon me in a summoning circle. Please don't, because you can't get out of a summoning circle, and that doesn't sound like fun. If you want me to come hang out with you, you just have to ask. You don't need to have these, um, but I would like for you to read these, any and or all that sound like they might be your thing, um, because I love them very, very much. Okay, if you made it this far in the video, and whew, if you did, we've been on a ride. If you made it this far in the video, leave me a skull emoji in the comments down below. That is all I have for today. I will see you guys next time. Bye!